we're going to go ahead and, and get started um, formally. So that was, I guess, a little bit of behind the scenes. And thanks again so much for being here with us today, Chris. And welcome to all of our participants. Thank you for joining us. Um, for the next episode of our digital transformation webinar series. Um, we're doing webinars and everyone's doing webinars and hopefully that this is, this is gonna be some really interesting information. I had the privilege and honor to look through um, Chris's thinking ahead of time and I, I really love his presentation. So I'm gonna get you over to him without further ado. But before I do that, just a couple um, minutes, I'll, I'll go a couple minutes about robots and pencils and then I'll, I'll pass the baton. So, and we will save some time at the end for Q&A. If you wanna post any questions you have in the chat, um, I'm gonna serve as a little bit of an MC today. So I may, um, you know, challenge Chris cause he's a content machine with, you know, uh, interrupting him a little bit in his presentation politely with questions along the way, but we'll also have some dedicated Q&A um, uh, during the message. So this is me, I guess if my headshot is, is in here too. So I've um, been in technology for over 20 years. I'm very fortunate um, to have gotten to learn so much from so many different people through the lens of technology and, and help them to grow and scale their businesses and expand their reach um, out to their customers. Um, so I, I really started in more of an engineering role and transitioned over the years um, into helping to lead teams and, and later um, leading organizations. So I've been with Robots and Pencils for a little over six years. I came in and joined the founder CEO um, as the president and then last year succeeded him as CEO. So I'm very excited to be taking Robots and Pencils really to the next um, level as we, as we grow and change as an organization and take advantage of, um, help our clients take advantage of the fast moving technology trends that can really impact their businesses. Um, so just a little bit of background about us. This is actually my favorite quote or one of my favorite quotes. quotes. So Chris, I'm a big reader. So we're talking about, you know, kind of how you get your perspective. But, you know, one of my classic books that I love, this actually came from uh, Great by Choice, which is like the, you know, follow up to, to Good to Great from Jim Collins. And one of my favorite quotes was, he talks about how innovation it's by itself is not the trump card that they had originally expected, you know, because people talk about innovation um, and it is very important. And you're, I know you're going to talk about that a little bit today. And we also think it's super important in R&P, but really the most important thing is the ability to scale the innovation. So it's that, that, that opportunity to look at the creative and ideation and the problem sets, but then uh, apply discipline to it, whether it's through you know, prioritization or experimenting or de-risking assumptions around a technical project. So just really one of my favorite and most inspirational quotes. Um, so r and is a digital innovation firm and that is what we do. So we engage with our clients and we help them create what's next for their business. We do try to do it in that blending creativity and discipline um, methodology. So in all the work we do, we blend the sciences and the humanities. So that's really the origin of our name. So we call our, our programmers, our engineers, our robots, and we call our designers, UX team, um, our information architects, we call them pencils. And we bring those teams together. You know, there's lots of firms in our space that will do design and development and we build out digital products together. But we really think we're differentiated is the way we work together. Um, throughout the course of a project, which um, we, bring, we bring very strongly integrated teams. So even at the early stage of discovery and design, we're bringing the engineering teams in to do discovery and design alongside the, um, the pencils, the designers, the UX people that are helping to do the problem solving. And then those designers and UX people also stay involved throughout the project as engineering obviously starts to take the lead in the build out of a project. So I, without further ado though, we're not here to talk about robots and pencils. We're here to hear from Chris. So Chris, again, thank you so much for joining us. Um, Chris is a, a digital strategist and, and a real thought leader and technology entrepreneur. He's got 30 years of experience and it sounds like all these different things that you've done and worked in Chris really inform um, your perspective. And it sounds like you draw from a lot of different bodies of work. Um, in film, music, video games, and you know, sounds like all kinds of technology. Um, so Chris is now the head of business innovation and strategy for Google, um, who in, he engages with companies in the top in the world to help develop digital transformation strategies that um, grow business value. I'm actually interested to see if you're working with my friend's company uh, around a use case in, in healthcare. But anyway, we can follow up on that. Um, Chris is also here to speak with us today, but he does lots of content. So he ho hosts the weekly business um, podcast or the podcast called the digital show or that digital show. Sorry, Chris. Um, and previously was at Fox broadcasting. So lots of storytelling. So I, I think Chris, what we, I have to say to you is to me, it sounds like you're a robot and a pencil. 
um, and also a, a professor and a teacher. And we are really excited to have you here with us today to share your information. So I'm gonna pass the presentation baton over to you. Thank you, appreciate it. Yes, let's make sure this all works here. Yeah, no worries. And just as a reminder, or for those that just joined in the last couple minutes, feel free throughout the presentation to post your questions and any questions you might have in the chat, and we will um, answer them either throughout or at the end. Thanks so much for joining us. Are you seeing my screen? We Are do. Are seeing the presentation? We see it. Well, then Over we're through. one step closer. Okay. Hello, everyone. Again, thank you for joining. And Thank you to Robots and Pencils for putting this together. I actually tuned in to a couple of the other in the series that you've done so far, and it's been really fascinating and interesting uh, for me. So uh, it's been great. And today we're gonna talk about innovation at scale and in the moment and building a culture for customer transformation, which might be a little different than what you have heard before. Uh, as I'll just quickly summarize again, my name is Chris Hood. I'm a digital strategist at Google. Um, I've got a background in media and entertainment, roughly 30 years. 20 of those years have been helping companies solve complex business and digital problems. I host the podcast for Google called That Digital Show, and you can find it on all of your podcast platforms. In my free time, I teach. I teach at Southern New Hampshire University and Colorado Technical University, and of course, if you would like to reach out to me, you can find me throughout social media. And here's my email address. Feel free to reach out to me at any time. And that's at hello at chrishood.com. You can also find me at chrishood at google.com. Uh, I'm happy for you to email me at either location. Okay, so one of the hardest things for you to do in technology is adapt your business to whatever the market demands. And the reality is, is one thing that has become increasingly clear over the last year is that disruption can happen at any time. And that's not just disruption because of a pandemic. This is disruption of your business, your market, your employees, all in the blink of an eye. And so these companies that are positioned to adapt through disruption ultimately will survive. And in some cases, we've even seen them grow. In fact, uh, disruption has been known to be a catalyst for innovation. Maybe we can consider it desperation or something. Uh, but there was a report uh, by Microsoft and IDC that found 41% of organizations viewed COVID-19 as an opportunity. And, and out of those, there is about one and a quarter they were uh, more confident they would, that they would recover quickly and 1.5 times more confident they would ma maintain or grow their revenues compared to their peers. But this outlook is only the starting point for actually making it happen. The real challenge is how do you make it happen? Here's some more stats for you. Today's customers are more curious, impatient, and demanding than ever before. So we see 63% of digital consumers expect companies to provide new products and services more frequently. 66% of digital consumers say it takes more to impress them. And 59% of digital consumers actively seek to buy from the most innovative companies. But here's the eye-opening stat to be aware of. 73% of digital consumers expect companies to know their needs before you even ask them what their needs are. Now, a lot of stats, a lot of interesting perspective here, but again, how do we do this? And more critically, how do we do this fast enough and at scale to avoid this disruption? So today we're gonna to talk about four critical areas, and these are technology, process, data, and people. The problem is most organizations are faced with these challenges when they're looking at these four areas. And so ask some questions here. In technology, does your company focus on the technology needed to complete digital, digital transformation initiatives? 
in the process, is your organization constrained by bureaucratic barriers or top-down product strategies? Are you focused more on protecting your data than exposing the data, especially if it's to competitors? And we're gonna talk about that a little bit. And then people, do you empower all of your employees to be a part of the innovation process? So we've got a lot to cover. Let's get right into it. The first one, the technology conundrum. What really is digital transformation and why does it matter? I'm sure you're all familiar with this scene. As we've highlighted just a moment ago, customers are expecting their favorite brands to personalize and connect digital experiences. You want to engage with them in the ways that you want. Here's the big challenge. They want these connected experiences, but they want them in their way, on their devices, in the platforms that they are loyal to. And sometimes that means not your technology. This is not a, if we build it, they will come type of scenario. This is building technologies to support something that you don't even know what it is or, well, or what it will do yet. Think about that for a moment. This is about building technologies that you don't even know what it is or what it will do. How do we do this? So what we are really talking about here is digital transformation, maybe. <laughs> We're, I'm gonna share some thoughts around this. So, but what is digital transformation? I'm sure you all have your own interpretations of, of this term, but there's really a simple definition. Digital transformation is the adoption of digital technologies by a company to improve business processes, innovation, and value for customers. And if we compare that against innovation, we see some comparisons. Innovation is the practical implementation of digital technologies and ideas that result in new products, services, and processes to improve value for customers. But both of these definitions, we clearly see digital technologies right at the beginning. And maybe though there's a, a, a different way that we can look at that. If we remove some of the tax, we could see digital transformation equals the adoption of digital technologies and innovation equals the practical implementation of digital technologies. Do these resonate with you? Do you agree with these? You can put it in the chat, let, let us know. But for myself, honestly, I'm not entirely sure these definitions capture the essence of digital transformation or innovation. If we look at the definitions again, there's a phrase here towards the end that really aligns things a little better. The value for customers. I think in most cases, maybe that's just too big of a what if. And so more than ever, organizations try to just focus on the starting point of digital transformation and innovation. They're focused on those digital technologies because that's what they believe they need. And they never actually make it to the end to realize customer value. So what if we turn things around just a little bit? What if we say, that digital transformation equals value for customers. And innovation also equals value for customers. Or maybe we can further simplify this and say that happy customers equals business value. I think this is a no brainer for everybody who's listening. But the key here is that customers come first. And the technology is simply the foundation for you to achieve business value or value for your customers. If we were to break down technology into the five key areas for you to focus on, they are cloud, APIs, security, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and data. And data sits underneath all of these. And we're going to get into data in a little bit. The cloud will help you to accelerate your innovation and collaboration, make you a little bit more flexible, 
adaptable, scalable. APIs will open up new markets. They will help you avoid disruption. They will generate opportunities for monetization and growth. Security will help you build trust with your customers, help you to reduce some complexities. And of course, artificial intelligence and machine learning are actively providing intelligence to, con to customers, making their experiences more predictable and personalized. And we all know that the big buzzword is personalized experiences now. And again, that's all sitting on data. I didn't spend a lot of time on the technology piece of this, but if you go and you research these five elements, they really are the keys to successful digital transformation and innovation practices. What I really wanna get into though, is what does that mean for your organization? How do you use this within your culture? So the next one is the outside perspective an external view of your company and the impact that view has on value. So another definition for you, outside in, it's the design perspective that starts on the outside of an organization from a customer's point of view before flowing inside the company to reach your backend data and services. So as we continue through today's materials, you're gonna have to keep one thing in mind, you, are a customer. We are all customers of various products every single day. When you walk into Starbucks, when you buy groceries, we were talking earlier about our lunches, we ordered some salads, you go to the gas station. Every day you are engaging with businesses digitally. You know which ones are easy, which ones are fun, unique, and most likely you return to those businesses that create the experience you want. And when the experience isn't something you want or you don't like, you're probably immediately thinking of ways that it could be better. Those ideas that you are thinking about is innovation and it's from the outside in. So if we are all customers and you understand what you like about certain products, why aren't you leveraging that same mentality when you're building your own products and services at your organization? Here it is. Most companies face this type of mentality, an inside out perspective. That's where they start from the inside with the type of technology they have, whether that technology has come in due to a digital transformation initiative, and now they know they have to use it, or the data that they have accessible or available, and they begin to expose experiences based on that technology. Now, this particular one is probably a no-brainer, but bear with me. We say we want to make a bank account available. That's inside-out thinking. If we turn this around, we get to the outside in perspective. And it's very subtle, but we see it from their viewpoint. I want to access my bank account. And when we see this happen, we see substantial shifts within organizations in the way they produce new products and services. We can begin to grow this perspective, build unique experiences along the way. I wanna access my bank account and I wanna check my balance. So if you're sitting here and you're the customer and you're going through this particular journey, what do you think comes next? What's the next experience that you want to see? Well, that's right, it's redeem rewards. <laughs> Maybe not. Maybe you didn't see this coming, okay. But here's the beauty of this model. It's not what you want to give them. It's what your customers want to have. And what we've seen in organizations that take this outside in perspective is that they're able to grow their business value by one X. Now that doesn't seem like a lot, but it is considering that all you're doing is shifting a perspective from inside out to outside in. 
customer is always first. We can expand this and we can get a complete journey in place now. And you'll see that we begin to experience more of a transformational or process. When organizations can complete an entire customer journey through an outside in perspective, they start to see 5x growth to their business value. That is substantial now, but it can continue to grow as you begin to put more intelligence behind this. This is not just about creating a journey. This is about understanding what the journey is and defining it as it's happening based on what your customers want. We are building the experiences as chunks that can be interchangeable as needed in the moment. And I'm gonna show you an example of how somebody has 10X that later. One other area that we have to consider in the outside in perspective is feedback loops. These are essential. It's going to help you not only understand what's happening externally with your customers, but it can also be used to help you improve employees and get their ideas and understand how to improve processes in the business. This is about feedback throughout your entire organization. Spend time analyzing the data, add new ideas to your product roadmaps, find and execute on this feedback. The key here is you build, you iterate, you improve, and then you ask all over again, how's it going? Here's an example. So there's a Dutch steel company and they have been using a suggestion box for 70 years. They have about 11,000 employees and they collect between 7,000 and 12,000 suggestions a year. Now a typical employee will probably make about six or seven suggestions annually. Uh, in one case, we actually saw an innovator uh, at, the, uh, at the plant submit 75 ideas over the course of one year, 30 of those ideas were actually adopted. And here's the kicker. One year, they were able to save $750,000 by a suggestion that was made by one of their employees. Nice. This, yeah, go ahead. So I, was, oh. I was cheerleading for that. <laughs> Just cheerleading. Yeah, it's incredible. And it shows you the power of inclusion of every single employee and every single customer a part of your feedback loop. It's not just about one team working on this. Sometimes we will build, yeah. Oh, sorry, I, um, but there's a little bit of a discussion going on before we go to this next slide sure. about yeah. your use of the word customer. Um, and Lisa's pointing out, she's wondering, you know, is a, is a better term user. And I figured with the amount of deliberation and deliberateness you have, you probably have a reason for using customer. Um, and just wanted to see if you'd be willing to riff on that for a moment. Sure. Because they're all customers. Tell me a user that's not your customer. Got it. It, it really is that simple. We're, we're in business to satisfy customers. Whatever you are building, even if it's a personal project, you have a user but ultimately they're using it for some purpose, that user is still your customer. I, I think that Lisa, I think the feedback was more that the word customer sounds outside in. Like I view someone as a customer or a client from inside my company, but they view themselves as, I don't know, a mom, a human, whatever. Um, so I think that was more the nature of the, of the feedback. So sure. just curious. Yeah, it, look, we can use any term to define the individual who is going to be using your products or services. It can be a user, a customer, a consumer, an agent. Uh, each one of the customers, and, and we don't really get into that here, but part of your outside in perspective is, is understanding who that individual is, right. what their background is, what their profile is, understanding what their motives and drivers are, Part of this center of excellence, which is something we're just about to talk about, is understanding that, you know, what is the problem? What is the problem do your customers, users, individuals have? And who are they? Because 
you may have a different problem than I do. Somebody else may have a different perspective than the other person. And when we talk about personalization, that personalization is about presenting opportunities and experiences to that individual, whoever they are. And yes, customers may also be internal customers. If you have business units or teams across different sectors and say your marketing team is working with your engineering team, for the engineering team, marketing has become our customer. So there could be any flavors of this. I'm using it in a generic sense, but ultimately it's an individual that you are trying to understand and provide a service to. Thank you. Hopefully that helps. We good? I think okay. it does. Thank you, Chris. Uh, let's go on. So the center of excellence, sometimes I've also heard it called center of enablement. It's a organization that helps you to better understand and define what are the problems, what are the questions, what do you want to do in your feedback loop, and how are you going to take advantage of it? I think one of the key elements for both the center of excellence and for your digital transformation and for your innovation and uh, a lot of those things is that these are not siloed organizations or, uh, or one-time projects or initiatives. Your innovation team should be no different than your human resources group or your engineering team or your marketing department. It is a group with a full-time budget, with full-time headcount that is doing nothing but helping your organization innovate and understand what the individuals, now I'm gonna call them individuals throughout the rest of the session, that are looking for and how they want to engage with you. And a lot of times we see digital transformation as being set up as a project, as a one-time initiative. So a good question to ask yourself is, when does digital transformation end? And the answer really is, it doesn't. We're in a digital world. It's going to continue. So you might as well have individuals in your organization that are focused on sustaining that transformation as long as you need it. Another way to track feedback and to understand if you're going in the right direction is OKRs and KPIs, object, uh, objectives and key results and key performance indicators. I'm not gonna get into a lot of these. Uh, there is just tons and tons of information and articles out there that walk through these and, and how to implement them. I think the key element for this is to understand that you should be tracking your success. Ultimately, this is data. And this is data that will help you in your decision making and to understand areas to improve in. And if you don't have this data, then you're missing on a big opportunity for that improvement. So if we look at the process and we're saying outside in, then here are the four takeaways for that. Once again, customers first, users, individuals, anybody who is going to be engaging with you. Uh, outside in perspective, always maintain that consumer centric perspective. And that's across business and technology decisions. You should not be bringing in technology for no reason. There has to be some sort of value proposition at the start of that that's going to influence why you want the technology. Don't bring in the technology and then try to figure out how you're going to use it. That's not the, that's an inside out look. Centralize, have a center of excellence, get a budget in place for innovation and digital transformation, KPIs, OKRs, track your progress, and then the feedback loop so that you can continuously improve upon all of this. And then underneath that is your business and technology goals. Once you understand what your consumers want, then you can define what your business and technology goals should be. Moving on, the innovation manifestation, mapping innovation opportunities with intelligent data. So organizations must actively mine and manage the collective wisdom and experiences in the firm's ecosystem to thrive in an increasingly competitive market. Okay, what is an ecosystem? 
it may look like this. I think everybody understands the basic premise of an ecosystem, but an ecosystem is really about data. There's data throughout your organization. There's data on different teams, sales, marketing, industry data. And then there's tools that we use to create more data. AI and machine learning, APIs have data, your products have data, your customers have data, your users all have data, and it's all connected in some way. That's an ecosystem. But in larger organizations and enterprises, when we look at the top companies in the world, their ecosystems begin to look more like this, where we begin to add in other industry data, actual data from outside your industry. Uh, we mentioned healthcare earlier. So if healthcare is your industry, what kind of data can we bring in from retail? And how does the data of retail collide with the data of healthcare? There's opportunities there. Other platforms, social media, Twitter, Facebook. And the challenging one is competitors. When I say this, every single person thinks I would never in a million years share my data with my competitors. Google does it. We do it all the time. Now, I know you're probably saying, but we're not Google. But that's not the point. Think of it like this. Imagine if your competitor was actually paying you $10,000 a month for your data. It's something to think about. And there are a lot of examples. I'm happy to share those later. In general, there are two different types of ecosystems, or at least thinking around ecosystems. The first one is your business uses someone else's data. This is probably the most common. If you're using anything like authenticate or log in with your Facebook credentials, you're plugged into another business's ecosystem. Or if you're using Google Maps or you want to put uh, somebody's Instagram photos inside of your application, that's all leveraging somebody else's ecosystem. It's great. It brings up a lot of unique opportunities and, and easy experiences for your users. Um, but it's not ultimately going to drive innovation or revenue for you. The second way we look at ecosystems is fostering your own ecosystem. And really, this is where the big bucks are. You develop an ecosystem leveraging your data or your services or your analysis, your products, digital products, and other people and industries and businesses come to you and pay you for that privilege. Most importantly is developers and other businesses that are using your ecosystem begin to innovate on your behalf. So this is where the scale comes in because now you have external individuals innovating new applications and ideas for you. It's not about your team doing it. It's about external customers, users, developers, individuals doing it. There's really four primary ecosystems. There's internal partner, industry, and public. An internal ecosystem is usually exclusive for your organization. It's primarily for different business units, developers that are building applications within your organization. That's all internal ecosystems. You can get into partner ecosystems, and that's really about building relationships between different, say, suppliers or different markets. Uh, you might have a joint go-to-market venture where you say, hey, let's uh, collaborate on something and build it and, and go to market. That's your partner ecosystem. You have industry ecosystems. This is where we help with things like supply chains or sales channels. Think of something like the relationship between Unilever and Target. Uh, they can share inventory levels or what's on the store shelves for merchandising. And all of that is going through APIs and running through a partner-based ecosystem. And then we get into the public ecosystems, which really wraps around all of the other ones and this is where we begin to expose our own data and share it with anybody who wants to come and monetize it, 
co-innovate, as we just talked about. And this is the place where you can begin to really build new business models or build subsets of your organization that can grow the business and also make more money. And again, I'll share an example of this uh, later. There's another interesting concept when we think about outside in perspective, and that's around the value gap. And this occurs when there's a perceived value and an experienced value, and there's a gap between those expectations. And we can see that sort of in this mock-up where we go back to our banking example, and you'll see between the transferring money to a digital wallet and making a purchase, there's this gap in the experience. Well, companies have begun to use this gap as another means of data to make improvements, to help better inform the customer, better inform our product um, management experiences, and to help us to then innovate and solve problems. And the really successful companies have started to not only use that for, um, from a data perspective that influences the product and experience, but they've also begun to add APIs, artificial intelligence, machine learning on top of it so that it can happen in the moment. Now we're creating predictable moments, personalized experiences that are evolving based on those individuals' preferences or needs or expectations, and everything is influenced by the data presented by that value gap. And if we once again look at the value of data, customers first, we've got new revenue opportunities, taking those APIs to create new business models, exposing that data in an ecosystem. We have data insights to help us better understand who's using our products and our services. How are they being influenced to help us make better decisions? And we're using the data to make decisions. Data-driven decision-making, once again, is not just about understanding your users, but it's also about understanding your employees. How are they adapting? How, are, how do they feel about their job? And what are their ideas? That's all data decision-making. And then, of course, AI and ML, once again, to help you further influence what consumers, customers, individuals want, and how to influence that with your business and technology goals. Okay, the customer transformation, how customer-centric approach leads to scaled innovation. Another one for you, senior executives almost unanimously, 94% say that people and culture are the most important drivers of innovation. I couldn't agree more on this. But that shift in culture is challenging for a lot of organizations, especially if those organizations are plagued with any type of bureaucratic processes, the inside out product design mechanisms, or even the more harmful, a culture of insecurity or pressure to avoid failures at all costs. You've heard it probably from other people. Google is a big proponent of this, and that's the understanding and ability for you to fail fast. And fail fast is not a scary thing. It's about learning. It's about evolving. It's about adapting. It's about being prepared to avoid disruption. And when we start to learn how to fail faster so that we can innovate quicker, then we begin to see this 10 acts of innovation. We got cost savings or cost uh, additional sales opportunities, we get to market faster, there's better efficiencies, there's a business agility for that adoption to avoid disruption. We have new business models, the customer journey is more insightful, and we get to innovate. Really, more than anything, everything that I'm really talking about today is simply a mindset shift. It's very hard for a lot of organizations to change their business models or change their business processes to influence these types of innovative activities. It's really, again, all about just shifting your mindset. 
On the left, we'll see sort of a traditional approach, very structured, very process oriented, process centric as opposed to customer centric. IT is stacked on top of each other. Business might define IT builds. It's all project based. It's budget per project. I know that might not be something people like to hear, but the better way to do this in the digital centric world that we're in is customer first, user first, individual first, outside in perspective. We're open. We're an open organization. We expose our data. We monetize that data. We have reusable assets like APIs that will decrease our production time or getting to market, or when disruption happens, we can quickly pivot because we already have reusable assets in place. And the budget is at a program level across innovation and digital transformation. If we really simplify this and we look at digital transformation, when we focus on digital transformation, it's usually the business trying to build technologies that are going to meet the customer's needs. And the customer or the consumer, user, individual, buy something, but we don't know if they had a good time, enjoyed the experience, or will return. We're in this kind of continuous digitization of the business itself. A different way to look at this is customer transformation. Because the reality is, is that it's the customers, and again, we're using this word, it's the users that are going to have an expectation that shifts. And you can't keep up with it. So how do we keep up with it? Not living in a perpetual digital transformation initiative, but to be able to be in a position that we can evolve as fast as the customers themselves transform. They will have a new expectation. You're already available to predict that before they ask for it. And by having something in place that you don't necessarily know what it will do, but when the time comes, it will do it. And they're more likely to engage with you on a regular basis and return because you're meeting their needs in the moment. And if we break this down into the four deliverables here for customers, employees, partners, competitors, users, individuals, consumers, fail fast, embrace failure in your organization, have diverse talent, attract the best and diverse talent, have a broad range of ideas and skills, all focused on different areas of innovation. Be sure you're sharing your knowledge across the organization. Do not live in silos. Have reusable assets that you can actually share across the organization and include everyone. Unlock people's capabilities. Let them be a part of the process so that your organization can innovate at scale. And the value proposition is this, a couple of more quick slides for us. Companies whose dominant business model is an ecosystem experience revenue growth approximately 27% points higher than the average for their industry and had profit margins of 20% above the average for their industries. So it's simply this. This is an MIT report that came out last year. If you focus on ecosystems, you begin to expose your data, even if it's to your competitors. You begin building an ecosystem, a digital platform. You can grow your business by about 27%. Here's another one. This is a slightly older one also from MIT. And this is uh, solely on the impact of APIs. But what was found in, and this number is definitely higher today, uh, the impact of API adoption on market capitalization was 12.7%. So again, you wanna grow your business, think about it in this perspective get an API program, build an ecosystem, and you're drastically growing your business. And here's an example, Bank BRI, they're an Indonesian company. Uh, it's a bank, obviously. 
they implemented the same digital strategies and the data strategies that I've outlined here with an ecosystem, and they were able to generate an additional $50 million in revenue annually. And I think that's up. This was last year's numbers. And this again is about building ecosystems and exposing data. Their people tools helped reduce partner onboarding time from six months down to under an hour and their process perspectives from an outside in improved loan approvals from two weeks to two minutes. These are drastic changes. And this is only one example. I have dozens and dozens of more, but we're out of time. So if we were to summarize all of this, here it is. On technology, make sure that you're fortifying the resilience, avoiding disruption by having the foundation of technology and digital in place. And we've talked about that. That's cloud, that's API, security, artificial intelligence, machine learning. Your processes maintain a customer user centric mindset in all activities across the organization. Data, leverage data to learn, build, grow, increase competitiveness, and people empower people to continuously drive a culture of innovation. And that is it. And with that, I'm sure there are plenty of questions. Happy to spend some time and talking to you. Thank yes, you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, your presentation was awesome. And that was a lot of content in a short period of time. Uh, lots of thinking. Yes. So thank you so much. Um, I'm going to uh, share a question that came up during your presentation, um, getting specifically around the, the data component. So um, Pedro posed the question or made the observation, and you know we're going to kind of turn it into you know your thoughts, which is moving towards that public ecosystem. And we see this when working with our clients too. Like it's it's a nuanced decision actually, right? And and I, I don't think you were representing it as not being nuanced, but I'm interested in you know kind of how you think about or how you guide that thinking in the trade-off management, because there are components that may be, you know, this data has to stay private to us, either um, it's requ regulatory requirements. I will say in my experience, there's a large amount of data that people think is competitive advantage, which in my opinion, a lot of times it's not, but people think it is. So I wonder, you know, I may be leading the witness, but I'm curious about your thoughts there versus things that sure. really can move into the public ecosystem and, and how you make those decisions. So just curious if you could share your a little yeah. bit more of your thoughts there. Yeah. So first, there is definitely a maturity model in this as well. I I would suggest to anybody who's thinking about moving into an ecosystem type of mindset to start simple, grow an internal ecosystem. There, there's nothing wrong with this. Build small, understand how ecosystems work, and then begin to add to that. Begin to introduce partners, begin to introduce external industry-specific data that, that you have available. Um, if you can get through those couple of ecosystems, then the next step to a public ecosystem becomes a, a little easier for you to achieve, although mindset-wise is still going to be a challenge. There will always be, well, we can't expose that data, and we've got regulatory issues for this data, and I don't want to give my competitors that data. So there's definitely also a mapping exercise. What is the data we have? What is the data that we can present? And what's the value of that data? And when we say value, monetize you know, the actual cost or monetizable aspect of it. Uh, is this worth a dollar? Is this worth five dollars? Um, and, and the other thing I would recommend is start to do your own research. Go out there and see what other companies are doing. A good example of this would be AccuWeather. So AccuWeather sells weather data and they sell it to everyone. If you see weather somewhere in an application, odds are it's coming from AccuWeather and somebody is paying to get that weather data. Yeah. And so you can go and you can see what other companies and other industries are doing and then start to build a plan. But don't think that this is something you can do overnight. This is definitely something that will take some time. There's definitely a maturity process to it, but it's, it's definitely a goal that I would say is not a, an, is not unobtainable and is definitely something you should consider because we see immense value of being generated in organizations who do it. 
Awesome. Chris, actually, I'm having one of those moments where something you said made me think of something, you know, um, and when you just mentioned, you know, kind of starting by opening the data up within the organization, especially inside of large companies. Um, but I'll tell you, I mean, our company is like 230 people, and I think it happens here. It probably happens once you have more than, you know, two systems that you use inside the organization. But I think the combination of making that data more available to people and then running some of those brainstorming sessions and bringing in even if it's you know internal stakeholders like you were bringing up earlier you know somebody came up with the seven hundred fifty thousand dollar idea that's i think that's a great first step that is a lot less um threatening for people and also can you know because it's all internal and you're sharing information within the company which that alone can be controversial never mind it leaving people's own walls um, and it can help be sort of training wheels to help people get more comfortable with these brainstorming sessions and this collaborative work. Um, so with that said, uh, I'm interested from your perspective, it can be really challenging to get people's time and feedback, whether they're internal users or customers. What are some of the things that you've seen work to get people you know, bought in and participatory in some of these types of, of sessions? Yeah, so there's a few things there. The larger the company is, the more data there is everywhere. And the more people, the harder it is to get perspective, right? Um, this has to be a part of your culture. This has to be a part of the DNA of the organization. This can't just be, hey, we're going to generate a questionnaire, a survey, and send it out to everybody by email and ask them to you know, respond by the end of the week. Yep. The, if we look at the steel company as an example, they had a suggestion program for 70 years. It was rooted in their DNA. Everybody knew about it. If you're getting 12,000 responses annually from your employees, they knew that it was there. That's how you do this. This has to be a part of the culture. I've said it time and time again, digital transformation is, is not really a digital initiative. It, it is a cultural initiative. This is about changing the culture of your organization to understand that everybody has a voice. Everybody is a part of producing the experience for their users. And business and technology have collided together. There is no more business versus technology. There's no more us versus them. There's no more business defines and technology builds. Business and technology and employees are one business. And that one business has to come together and understand what they want to do. And they have to do it collaboratively across all teams. And that is rooted in, in the culture of your organization. So once you do that, then getting ideas and submissions and participation becomes a lot easier. Awesome. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, super appreciate you sharing. Totally agree with you. Um, and, and great to hear some of your really specific examples and, and tactics that we can use. Um, we'll send out this presentation as will be recorded and feel free to share it with colleagues. Again, thank you so much and hope to meet you preferably in your area sometime soon in person. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to. And thank you to all of our attendees. I hope you have a wonderful day. Super appreciate you.